After today's second story, you'll never step foot near Fairbanks, Alaska again. It's cold up there anyway, so you'd better cozy up by the fire where it's warm and monster free. For now. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can find more of my narrations on my other podcasts, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. You can find those shows and this one on your favorite podcasting app. Today, I've got an assortment of unexplained terrors featuring monsters in the cold, monsters by the shed, monsters by the barn. Wait, this is all just monsters. Ah, don't worry. There's some ghost stories in there too. So enjoy. Don't forget to send me your true stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also, check out eeriecast.com for more terrifying shows like this. Now, let's begin. Something was outside. From in gone another account. Just out of college, my friend, who we call Livewire due to an old joke, didn't have a lot of money. So his aunt and uncle who lived on a farm let him stay in a shed on the property until he got his own house. This shed was a stable place just on the edge of the property near a thicket of trees, resulting in bad Wi-Fi service, of course. However, Livewire wasn't bothered by that and was more than thankful for the place. He said it was very peaceful and would often boast to our friend group about how perfect it was and how they had to come over and see it. At the time, Livewire had been in the shed for about three weeks. Before long, my boyfriend, Cole, gave in and decided to spend a week with Livewire. According to Cole, it was a pretty neat place. The shed was well built, had electricity, heaters, a fan, a kitchen, and a bathroom. The service wasn't as bad as the Wi-Fi, but it wasn't great. Livewire even managed to hook up his PlayStation to the TV. After Cole arrived and unpacked his stuff, the two of them went for a walk in the woods to a nearby pond, where they spent the afternoon swimming and fishing. By the time they started to head back, it was dark, and as cliche as it sounds, the woods went quiet. This put Cole on edge right away, but Livewire laughed at his tense friend. They walked a bit further, until they reached the shed. As Livewire went to unlock the door, they heard this coyote-like howl. Cole turned to Livewire, his face as white as a ghost. Did you hear that? Cole asked. Livewire laughed. What? Just a coyote call? That was no coyote call, Cole said. The call was strange, slow and drawn out. Livewire unlocked the door and pushed it open. Cole, it was just a coyote call. I've heard them every night. No need to be paranoid. Cole tried to listen to his friend as they went to play the PlayStation, but he could hear that one low, drawn-out call again. It sounded as if someone recorded that phantom howl, playing it back repeatedly. Around 11 p.m., the boys decided to head to bed. Cole still couldn't sleep, and the silence of the woods was unsettling. Soon, Livewire's snoring echoed through the shed, and after that... The howling started again. This happened for the first two nights. On the third night, however, was when everything went awry. At around 2 a.m., Livewire was asleep, but Cole had awakened, feeling hot with a racing heart. He went to the bathroom and washed his face. Of course, the woods were silent again. Cole went to the fan at the end of the bed. He was about to turn it on, then he froze. The coyote call came again. He'd grown accustomed to the sound, but this one was close. Too close. It sounded like the coyote was right outside the shed. The howl came again. Cole turned the fan on, walking to the window just behind the beds. He didn't see anything. The call came once more, and it sounded even closer. Cole, quietly but quickly, got into the bed, pulling the covers up over his head, leaving only his eyes exposed. 
The howling was so loud now that Cole was sure Livewire would wake up any second. After one loud and extended howl, everything fell silent, except for Livewire's snoring and the gentle hum of the fan. A few minutes passed like this before Cole heard heavy footsteps on the gravel outside the shed. He slowly lifted his head out from under the covers, just enough to peer out. There, illuminated by the full moon, was the shadow of a muscular, hairy figure with large ears standing on two legs. Cole did not dare look behind him to see what was casting that shadow from the window. Time felt as if it dragged on as this thing stared in. It felt like hours before finally it turned its head toward the woods and walked away. As it turned, Cole saw that it had a muzzle like that of a dog. He told Livewire about it in the morning, but Livewire, thinking he was joking, laughed everything off. Cole stayed for the remainder of the week, but he never ventured into those woods again. An Alaskan Warning From Pale Okra 2464 This is a warning for anyone living or visiting Fairbanks, Alaska. Avoid the eastern side of Farmer's Loop and steer clear of Sheep Creek Road at night. About 10 years ago, I encountered my first cryptid. I was driving home from the hospital with my mom. We resided in the middle of Farmer's Loop. As the hospital is closer to the eastern side, we took that route back. Shortly after turning onto Farmer's Loop, there's a clearing that some might consider a field due to its size, but it's more a clearing. A large metal tower stands in the center, surrounded by forest. I was in the passenger seat, and on that dark night, my mom had the car's brights on. As we were about to pass the clearing and drive past the forest, we spotted it. Initially, we mistook it for a dog, but when it emerged from the ditch into the light, it was quite clear that it wasn't. It crawled on all fours, resembling a naked person on the ground, but its skin was unnaturally pale. My mom started screaming and drove faster. As a child, I was terrified. As we drove by, it lifted its head, revealing its face, either eyeless or with black eyes. There was no mouth, but it seemed to attempt a smile. We only discussed it in the car that night and never again. Despite my attempts, my mom claims not to remember, but there's a knowing look in her eyes whenever I bring it up. That's one reason to avoid the eastern side of Farmer's Loop. Another reason is the lingering feeling of a poison on that road. I've never witnessed such a transformation in a place. Once filled with contented people leading good lives, it's now inhabited by those who pretend to be happy, exuding a sense now of something being amiss. Additionally, there's a homeless camp out there named Dead Man's Cemetery that should be avoided. If you venture there too late at night, you'll encounter a man who stands by the road and stares you down. After a decade without any monster sightings, and with nearly convincing myself that the unsettling events of the past 10 years were unreal, something happened that night that shattered my skepticism. It reaffirmed that the poison in that place was real and spreading. I decided to embark on a late night drive, passing the university and venturing down Sheep Creek Road. Beyond the university, there was a sudden flash of light resembling an explosion. I dismissed it until another flash appeared two minutes later, coinciding with my car's tire light coming on, an ongoing issue that prompted me to turn back to Fairbanks and fill the tire with air at a gas station. While searching for a place to turn around, I glimpsed the source of the flashes. Lightning, but there was something unusual about it. Six bolts emanated from the same point in the sky, curving outward before striking the same location and they were all eerily silent. I found it odd, but returned to investigate further, 
after rectifying my tire situation. The flashes recurred every three minutes, prompting an unusually high number of Sheep Creek residents to leave their homes. As I rounded the bend from before, darkness descended. Not just typical nighttime darkness, but an almost palpable blackness, revealing solely the road and the tree outlines illuminated by the car's headlights. Yet I continued to drive. Just before the train tracks, facing the hills where the lightning was originating, there was another flash. However, this one was much larger, illuminating the sky, revealing everything. It lasted around 10 seconds, displaying a human-like figure within the lightning. From my perspective, I discerned arms, legs, a torso, and a head. Following that, the flashes ceased, and I hurried home. Thus, I'm pinning this as a warning to Fairbanks residents. Avoid these roads at night. You might encounter the eyeless monster, or the figure in the lightning, both of which I'm quite sure are not friendly. Something in the tree from someone came knocking. This story is about 10 years old, yet it continues to haunt me whenever I recall it. I'm from a Caribbean island. The village where I reside was not very developed at the time and lacked sufficient street lamps to illuminate our roads during the night. As a result, significant portions of the road were perpetually shrouded in darkness. While my family home wasn't situated within the village itself, it was positioned about 500 feet along the road leading out of the village. It wasn't unusual for us to venture out in the evenings to procure food for the family. However, my mother never allowed us to do so on our own due to concerns about us traversing the dark roads alone. There stood this eerie tree roughly 100 feet from my house. This tree occupied a stretch of the road that was enveloped in complete darkness during the night. The tree had an aged appearance, with its branches sprawling out, devoid of any leaves. In the daytime, it appeared twisted and lifeless, but at night, it took on an uncanny semblance of being alive, watchful. Consequently, whenever anyone walked by it, they would hasten their steps, sometimes practically running past it, as if they were keen on avoiding lingering around this tree for too long. During my teenage years, I found this notion absurd. Why would anyone, especially an adult, be so scared of a tree? Well, I was destined to discover the reasons soon enough. On a particular night, my sister and I were making our way down to the village from our home. Walking about 20 feet ahead of us was our next door neighbor, whom I'll refer to as Jim. Jim was around 60 years old, and he had a habit of taking his evening walk at the same time every day. Although we had been neighbors for years, he rarely engaged with my family. He and his wife generally kept to themselves, and this didn't bother us much, aside from exchanging our regular greetings when we crossed paths. Jim walked with a cane, and I could hear a tapping with every step he took in the darkness. The road was empty except for the three of us, I watched Jim walk right into the pitch black area where that massive tree stood. Neither my sister nor I could see Jim, but we could hear the faint tapping of that cane as he continued to walk. Suddenly, a piercing scream emerged from the darkness, thoroughly starting both my sister and me. A chill ran down my spine and my eyes widened with fear. I saw Jim then hurriedly emerging from the dark, his cane quivering violently in the night air. He positioned himself beneath a lamppost where the dim lights cast by street lamps illuminated the road just barely. His eyes were wild, and he yelled at my sister and me, demanding to know, Why did you do that? We were utterly shocked. We had no clue what he was talking about, but he continued to shout, accusing us of throwing stones at him in the dark. 
Despite our earnest attempts to explain that it wasn't us, though we had no comprehension of the situation, he refused to give us a chance. We eventually disregarded his outbursts and carried on walking into the darkness. Just as he had claimed, the sound of small stones hitting the ground followed closely behind us. I peered up into the tree, frantically searching, hoping to spot someone standing on a branch or to hear the laughter of a child or a friend providing their location in the darkness. However, there was nothing. Through the bare branches of the tree, I could see the night sky. No one, nothing was in that tree. So, what or who was responsible for hurling those stones at us in the dark? To this day, I still wish I knew. The Forest by My Grandmother's Home From False Shadow This incident occurred around four years ago when I was 16 years old. It was on a chilly weekend in November. During that weekend, my sister and I stayed at my grandparents' house to look after her elderly dog and the house. My grandmother had gone to her sister's birthday celebration with her husband. My grandmother resided in an extremely rural area of Germany, and my sister and I were accustomed to staying there from our childhood. I vividly remember that location as an incredibly beautiful place, with dense green woods and serene spots, perfect for walks, hikes, or simply enjoying nature. The property transitioned seamlessly into the woods, devoid of fences or walls. Remember, this was in Germany, where bears or pumas weren't present, and the few wolves we had were gradually returning. Furthermore, this was in West Germany, nowhere near countries where moose might roam. The beauty of the woods in this region underwent a drastic change over the past decade due to the spread of the bark beetle. I'm not entirely certain if this is the correct name for it, as I've had to translate the name to help you understand. Consequently, large sections of the once lush and thick forests were felled, resulting in areas almost devoid of trees. However, the small yet dense woods near my grandma's house had been relatively spared, at least up to that point. During the mentioned weekend, I volunteered to walk the dog three to four times a day. This dog was my childhood companion a large Rottweiler mix with an extraordinary bond and a mix of sweetness and guard dog instincts. Even at almost 15 years old, she could still discern good people from bad ones. On the Friday evening of that weekend, we bid farewell to my grandma and her husband. While my sister prepared some dinner, I took the dog for a walk around 7 in the evening. Given that it was November, darkness had already fallen about two hours earlier. Yet I felt comfortable in these woods, and I was accompanied by a large dog. So despite being a 16-year-old girl alone, I felt safe. Opting for the woods as our path, we embarked on a journey through an area I remembered from childhood, albeit not as vividly as other parts of that forest. As mentioned earlier, it was completely dark by then, and I had picked up a habit from my grandmother of carrying a headlamp for walks in the dark. Since I tended to trip easily, that headlamp was practically a necessity. As we approached an unfamiliar part of the forest, where there were several ponds, I became cautious. I turned off the music, which I'd been playing in one ear up until then, to focus on the path. It was during that moment when I felt it, an emotion I'd never experienced before, one that I haven't felt since. It was a feeling of profound sadness and anger, emanating not from me, but from something unseen and unheard. The dog, usually a few steps ahead of me, sniffed at the ground, changing her behavior, because she then turned around, came to my side, ears perked and body tense. I held onto her collar, prepared to restrain her if she charged towards something or someone I could not see. Looking around, I spotted a small pond, mostly covered in algae. 
An odd kind of anger persisted from the direction of that pond, discouraging me from continuing forward and instead urging me to flee. An intense urge to either vomit or run overwhelmed me, yet I remained frozen, like a deer caught in headlights. My dog by my side was likely experiencing similar emotions as she began to growl. In a strange twist of behavior, the dog's growling ceased, and she instead lowered her ears, tucking her tail between her legs and retreating backward along the path we had taken. While I was thinking about her odd reaction, the sound of someone crying reached my ears. I couldn't discern whether the cries belonged to a woman or a man. They conveyed intense sadness and anger, as though from a broken heart. Goosebumps covered my body, and I reminded myself to take a deep breath. With the feeling that someone might be in distress, I called out to them, asking if anyone out there needed some help. The crying grew louder, and from the change in volume, I could tell they had moved from behind the hedges and trees surrounding the pond. They circled around the pond and were now approaching along the path towards me. Although no one was in sight, based on the crying's position. I should have been facing them now. I remained there, petrified, still as a statue. Abruptly, the crying ceased, and the anger replaced the sadness. This sudden shift unfroze me, and, joining my dog in retreat, I slowly backed away. As soon as we turned a corner, obscuring the pond from view, the dog relaxed. We hastened home, and only upon leaving the forest did the oppressive sensation finally and fully lift. I chose not to disclose this experience to anyone, and in retrospect, I felt somewhat foolish. Perhaps it could have been kids playing a prank on me. It was only 7pm after all, and there were houses about 500 meters away. But then, how did they achieve it? Using a Bluetooth speaker? I had a headlamp on, and I could see almost everything in front of me, and yet, I could not find anyone. But a more pressing question lingered. How did they manage to evoke in me, and the dog, that sense of anger and sadness? Even more perplexing, how did they convince a massive Rottweiler mix to flee? rather than confront whatever they were. During the following morning's walk, I lacked the courage to return to that spot. However, on the afternoon stroll, I ventured back with the dog. She behaved entirely normally, save for sticking closer to me than usual. Except for the absence of any birds, nothing strange occurred. We came back to that pond in particular, while the other ponds there boasted ducks, geese, and fish, that particular pond was almost devoid of life, possibly due to its overgrown state. However, numerous reasons could explain this, given that it was November. But I have no definitive explanation for what transpired, only countless theories. Of these, the one I find most plausible is that it was a type of forest spirit neither malevolent nor benevolent, rather a guardian of the woods. It might accept human presence and their effects as long as they don't harm the forest. With the changes occurring in recent years, though, perhaps it has become distressed by the ongoing destruction of its home. Maybe I accidentally intruded upon its personal pond, its crying space, that night. Since then, my grandmother divorced her husband, not my grandpa, and moved to Munster, a major city in Germany. The dog mentioned in my story had to be euthanized the month after the incident due to her deteriorating health. I miss her immensely, especially every winter. I will likely never return to that place, because truthfully, with so much of that forest now gone, it no longer feels like the landscape of my childhood. I sincerely hope that not all of the once forested area will transform into construction sites. Hopefully, 
a substantial portion of the woods will be preserved. The Girl in the Kitchen from R. D. and Hall The following events occurred in the early 2000s, when I was in my early 20s. Fresh into the world of university and freedom, while my then-girlfriend, who was one year behind me, was still going to college, thus still living with her parents. For the sake of anonymity, I'll refer to my friends as D and M, with my ex-girlfriend being V and her sister being J. Now, as I said, my ex still lived with her parents, and her parents lived in a relatively new-build home in one of the more modern, fancy areas of the city, considered to be a bit more posh than the others. It was a large four-bedroom house with a respectable-sized back garden in a semi-private cul-de-sac, surrounded only by other such fancy houses. My ex's father was rather well off amongst the higher paid of the company he worked for, albeit with a bit of an ego as it had gone to his head. It was late summer, and in true British fashion, whenever you got a sliver of warm weather, a hint of sunshine and a promise of no rain for at least a few hours, a barbecue was called for. So, one was held, by my ex's parents, at their place. Naturally, friends and family were invited, and we found ourselves spending most of the afternoon and early evening in a rather spacious large back garden, drinking, laughing, kissing with our respective other halves. I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. We were young, hormones were all over the place, and alcohol was involved. It was at about 9pm that we decided that we'd head out to the local alt nightclub in the city. Sure, we could have skipped franchise bar to franchise bar through the city center and old town, putting up with overly loud early 2000s Britpop and floors sticky enough that anything dropped was lost forever. But that wasn't our style. We were generally an alt lot. Mostly. D was something of a DJ at the time. But even he knew with our current happy buzz, our moods would only sour at Weatherspoon's fair and environments. So we happily idled out from V's house, up the cul-de-sac and to the roadside, waiting for one of the very last buses into the city for that evening. When we got there, we wandered down the main roads, up until we got to the familiar black and white gothic lettered aesthetic of the club, with the queue already building up to let people in for the night. The place was called Spiders, pretty much the only thing of its kind in Hull basically an experience in itself. We got in, set to enjoying the night, and did just that. We had cheap sugary drinks, god-awful frozen hamburgers that were probably overpriced, but way too good for what they were, honestly, and a night full of classic rock, metal, and emo music. It was around midnight when we decided to head back, leaving the club to catch a large taxi to take us back to V's family home. Myself, D, M, V, and D and M's respective girlfriends piled in and arrived back home around half past twelve. The girls made their way upstairs. The guys made their way into the living room to crash for the evening. Of course, we were still just a little buzzed. We decided to flick on the TV, clicking through Sky channels before settling on good old late night sci-fi. Now here's the thing. I get happy, I get buzzed, but I don't get drunk. So as the hours went, with some Neon Genesis Evangelion marathon, the drunkenness and exhaustion of D&M began to kick in. D was quite content to just pass out on the floor, softly snoring away, while M got philosophical. Probably a bad idea to watch Evangelion with a drunk Christian, and after about an hour, he too had started to slip off. By then it was about 2.45 a.m., maybe 3 a.m., when something awoke me. My stomach grumbled, so I got up, in the mood for some barbecue leftovers. I figured a late night burger, a glass of water, and I'd be fine. So with that, I crept from the living room into the kitchen and paused sharply. Now, the kitchen floor was one of those fancy tiled floors, so it wasn't too warm at the best of times. 
always just a bit cool. But this, ooh, this was absolutely freezing. The air was chilled, and I could see my breath in front of me. Mildly buzzed, I put that down to it maybe being a colder than normal August night. Sometimes it happens, but my thoughts were on my stomach at the time. So I set about, fishing out a plate, sneaking the burgers into the microwave, fishing out a glass for water, as I started to make my masterpiece. It was then that I noticed that apart from the buzz of the microwave, it was completely silent. I mean, absolutely quiet. I looked about, confused, before eventually shrugging it off. And after a few more moments, I heard a very distinct, feminine sob. I stepped toward the edge of the kitchen, looking about, and in the dark I spotted a figure with long hair in the study just off the kitchen. I couldn't really get a clear impression of them, but I could clearly hear her crying, sniffling, sobbing toward the corner of the room. My drunken mind started going through who it could be, and I settled on V's younger sister, Jay. Now, she had not had the best night. A crappy afternoon at work, trouble with her parents, and she was told she couldn't come out drinking with us. So I was piecing together that something had happened at the time. Maybe an argument with a friend. Maybe just crappy moods. Hey, you okay? I whispered, trying not to wake anyone. But of course, it was the buzzed sort of whisper so it was probably loud enough to wake the dead. The girl in the corner kept sobbing, sniffling, pausing when I spoke, before shaking her head no. When the microwave dinged, I was quick, grabbing my burger, putting it on its monstrosity of a bun, and pulling up a chair by the doorway of the study. Yeah, figured. Look, I don't know what's up, and I probably suck at advice, but... I just want to let you know you're not alone. I'm here and I'm not going to force you to tell me anything. I'll just be here, okay? With that, I would sit down, listening to the soft sniffles and sobs. They continued, but I noticed they were lessening. Maybe she said a few things. I didn't really pick them up as I ate my burger and just sat there. Being as supportive as I could awkwardly be at 3 a.m. After a few minutes, the sobbing had stopped, and I heard a distinct, Thank you, as the girl stood and quickly moved past me. It was dark and details weren't clear, but something did at the time feel a bit off. Jay was surely older than that, right? older than the girl I just saw. After a few more minutes, I shrugged, finishing my burger, refilling my drink, and making my way with that tipsy not-so-silence back into the living room. As I settled back down into my chair, M was still out cold, but after a few moments, D spoke up. Who is that crying? So I told him. I explained it all, that I sat there, ate, and that she must have gone back upstairs afterwards. But at this point, Dee was just staring at me. Dude, it wasn't Jay. No one's gone up or down those stairs this whole time. We both turned, looking toward the stairs that led up to the bedrooms in the house. Odd. A slight shiver passed through me at the moment as we both just settled down in silence. I'll uh, check in the morning then. The morning after, as we sidled to the land of the living, one after the other, I took the moment to talk to V's mother to one side. I explained what had happened, what I'd heard, what I'd seen, and how cold it had been. Oh, her. Yeah, she's... she's regularly about... It turned out the family were familiar with their extra guest. No one knew who she was, just that she was often heard crying at night, always around the kitchen. Sometimes they glimpsed her, 
but their best bet was connected to the land which the house was built on. You see, these fancy large houses were mostly built on an area that used to be marshland and has since been covered and filled in for property development. And during the rougher periods of the 1700s and 1800s, criminals used to dump, well, anything that they didn't want to be found into these marshes, and that included bodies. So as far as anyone could tell, the mystery girl was probably someone dumped from around that time. I didn't think much more of it until a few months later, when I noticed in the shared accommodation I was in that things were being weird. About 2 a.m., I heard something and I felt chill. So stepping out of my bedroom, I went downstairs into the kitchen. The kitchen was ice cold, but nothing more. As I went back to go up to my room, my downstairs roommate, who was in a wheelchair, came out. Hey, you hear anything? Yeah, why? Well, you know what it is? Because I keep thinking it's one of you guys, but I check and you're not there. I just shook my head. The next day, I got in touch with my ex's parents. She wasn't my ex just yet. And I asked if they had had anything more with the girl. Apparently, it had been quiet for months. No sign of her. No chills, nothing. So they thought maybe she had moved on. It took me a number of years, relationships breaking apart, and all that, until I lived where I do now, to realize that the girl hadn't quite moved on. Instead, it seemed she had attached herself to me, the one who showed her kindness. I've had odd experiences, strange chills, my cat even bolting about every now and then, but only when I started really looking that I catch some truly unusual stuff. I found things on my shelves starting to slowly move before me, but when I cough or clear my voice in a somewhat stern, authoritative way, they stop and even go back. I get the impression that this girl is young, and after a recent run in the past year of getting interested in the paranormal again, I decided to try out a spirit talker app in my flat. One string of phrases stood out to me. Girl. Young. Touch. Cat. Please? What made this interesting was that my cat was sleeping on the couch at the time. I spoke out loud, stating that she could, in fact, touch my cat but I warned her that the cat may not like it, because she was old and a bit frail. What I got, in a very distinct tone, that sounded like an upset child, just confirmed it all, really. Sorry, I will not bother you. So I've come to accept that, well, I have an attachment. She's harmless, young, curious, but it's been about the past twenty-odd years and seems almost normal at this point. I'm used to the chills in the hallway, used to the things being moved, so long as they're put back. All because of a single moment of kindness, it seems. I don't believe she's malevolent or hostile, just curious. And it's kind of reassuring, to be honest, that in my life there is this sort of innocence, even if it's someone who may never be able to be identified or properly put to rest. But be careful. Not all attachments are good or kind, and all it takes is one moment, one action of openness, and they can remain with you. A Visit at the Barn From Akirate I grew up in a foster home, and I was raised at a farm with a lot of horses, sheep, dogs, and cats. My foster parents are really strict, and my daily chores were to feed all the animals at specific times during the day. The farm is located in the middle of nowhere, and during winter, it's pitch black out. The only way to not stumble is to have a headlamp and let the dogs guide you. The farm is over 100 years old, and all over the place there are old tools. I always had an eerie feeling at night here, like something was watching me, but I always trusted that the animals would tell me if something was wrong. One night, of course during winter, 
I put on my lamp and took the dogs with me, having the oldest dog guide me down the hill. Right in front of me, I could kind of see the two pastures that are used for the sheep sometimes, but they were empty that night. They are not very big, and there are no trees, only a shelter that is approximately three meters high. I had this eerie feeling again, and just a few seconds later, I saw the dog stop, staring out into the darkness. She was tense in her whole body, and I asked her out loud what was wrong. I then looked in the same direction she was, and I saw it. My headlamp lit the pasture, and in it stood this black shadow. As I said before, there are no trees, nothing near the pasture to give a shadow like that. It looked like it was either facing me or the other way. Since I couldn't see the details, I couldn't be sure. But I could see what looked to be arms, and I could tell it was tall, as tall as the roof on the shelter. It didn't do anything. It just stood there, almost as frozen as I was. I couldn't see its face. It was just a black silhouette, really, with legs, long legs. The next second, the dog started to run and bark like crazy. She just left me there, rounding the barn to the entrance of the pasture. I was terrified. I quickly ran after her, calling her name, but she didn't answer. But she usually does. I heard her continue barking when I ran, and when I got to the entrance, she fell silent but still faced the exact spot where I'd seen that shadow. The pasture was empty, and she kind of looked surprised. It was the, what was I barking at, kind of expression on her. We continued the night, and I felt nothing more, and I haven't seen anything like it since. But I know something was there that night, since our dog saw something too. She was raised on that farm for 14 years and didn't bark nor run away if she didn't feel the need to defend us. High Strangeness at an Oregon Motel From Bad Kyle 69 This incident took place when I was 28 years old. I am 33 now and I am still perplexed as to what happened. I spent my entire 20s traveling across the states, playing in an underground rock and roll band. While I'm grateful for those experiences, sometimes you encounter things of the unknown variety. This particular incident occurred during the midpoint of our 30-day tour when we played a show in Grants Pass, Oregon. We decided to stay at a motel on the edge of town. While we stayed at some pretty shady places in the past, this one had security guards patrolling the outside of the building. It wasn't really a bad area, quite sparsely populated in fact. Three of us slept in the room, one staying in the van. As it was getting pretty late, I was just falling in and out of sleep when I heard the sound of someone fumbling with the lock. I then saw the shadow of two small feet beneath the door. After a moment... The door opened, and standing there was a short woman in her sixties wearing a red raincoat. Mind you, it had not been raining at all that day. It felt almost like a dream. She walked into the room, standing between the two beds. She then placed her hand on my bass player. That's when the drummer woke up and told her to leave. She departed, but very slowly. After she was gone, we rushed outside the room to find her, but she had already vanished. At first, I thought it was a dream, until my drummer confirmed that he'd seen the same woman. She had made no noise, and her face was obscured by a hood. That night, my bandmate who slept in the van mentioned that security guards had been shining flashlights, searching for someone near the edge of some brush outside the motel. The strangest part of the whole encounter was when we were checking out the next morning. We informed the desk clerk 
that a woman had entered our room in the middle of the night, and we asked if there was any way she could have gotten in. The employee explained that the doors automatically lock when they close. The guy in the room next to ours overheard the conversation and said, That's really strange. I had a terrible nightmare last night that someone entered our room and killed me and my entire family. Strange indeed. Any thoughts on this? Highway Hitchhiker from Medzi. When I was a teenager, my mother and I experienced something we still to this day cannot explain. We live in a tourist town, and in the summer our population at least triples. We were stuck in slow crawling bumper to bumper traffic. On this stretch of highway, we were at most going 15 to 20 miles per hour. As we came to the part of the highway that's a long stretch of straight road with open fields on one side and woods on the other, I spotted a man from afar. For some reason, my eyes were drawn to him. I noticed he was looking in our direction and just standing still, but I couldn't see much detail as he was about 100 yards away. As we inched nearer, I couldn't take my eyes off of him. It was like I was being entranced by something to just stop everything I was doing and stare at him. When we started getting closer, I began to notice some unsettling details. Although there were about 50 vehicles in front of us and about the same amount behind us, he was definitely staring directly at me. I could see from far away up until he was right next to me that his focus was on our car alone. He looked to be in his fifties, he had scruffy white hair and a beard, and he was thin and pale white. He was wearing a red plaid button-down shirt with a black backpack on, and he looked like the typical hitchhiker. That was until we pulled up right next to him. The man was grinning ear to ear, almost inhumanly, and his eyes were so ice blue they almost looked completely white. As we drove by, his head turned and followed our car still. I turned my whole body to face back, keeping eye contact with him. As he faded into the distance, he never lost eye contact with me, and he continued to stare at our car until he was completely out of sight. After it happened, it was like the whole world switched back on for me. I turned to my mom, asking if she had seen what I just saw. We both agreed how weird it was that he picked us out of the crowd to stare down, never to shift his gaze, and how pale his skin and eyes were. Now, I'm a very pale person, but compared to me, his skin was almost translucent white. My mother likes to compare him to a white walker from Game of Thrones. It was such a creepy experience for both of us. After some research, I discovered that it's known in our town that that stretch of highway is supposedly haunted. People have claimed that people jump in front of their cars, and when they swerve out of the way or hit the supposed person, nothing actually ends up being there. As a result, it's a hot spot for accidents and for paranormal encounters. I'm thankful it was just a stare down with this man and not something much worse. Probably Haunted House From Peach Jaguar 7587 My whole family agrees that our old house was weird, to say the least. We've all had strange experiences, but for some reason, mine were the creepiest out of all of them. It seemed to start before I was born, with a story my mom told me. It was when my sister was five or six, and she was playing in our backyard. My brother was a baby at the time, and my mom was playing with him in his room. From the window, you could see into the backyard, but not the swing set my sister Mal was on. My mom was just grabbing a toy from my brother when she heard a voice. 
It was a small and innocent voice, but it wasn't one like anyone in the family had. It didn't sound like it came from a person, but more from the back of her head. She heard it again. Is she okay? All of a sudden, she got this feeling like something was wrong. She put my brother back in his crib and ran down the stairs and outside. What she saw was Mal on her back, fallen from the back of the slide. She must have slipped from the ladder, which wasn't very tall, but it was a bit of a fall for a toddler. She was passed out, and my mom ran over. She picked her up and brought her inside. She was fine after that, but if that voice hadn't been there, my sister would probably have been out there for a while. Now for one of my creepiest encounters. I was 11 or 12 years old, and I was in my basement. It's set up with a couch against the wall, with the stairs to your left, and the hall, with bedrooms and normal basement stuff, to your right. I was home alone at the time, on my mom's laptop, and our two dogs were sleeping on the floor in front of me. My parents and brother were at work, so I knew no one would be home for a few hours. I was focused on the game I was playing. I had the sound off, because I hated loud noises. I then heard my name being called. Hey, come here. I froze. The dogs even looked around, awakened from their slumber. That voice wasn't anything like my parents or brothers. It was deep and almost inhuman. Hello? Gabriel? Are you home? Don't be shy. I'm just over here. Gabriel, stop it. No one answered. I ran up the stairs to see if there was a car in the garage, but it was empty. I asked my brother about it a while later. He usually came clean about pranks like this after a few months but he said he never remembered doing anything like that. My siblings had paranormal experiences, seeing things, feeling odd sensations in the house. Either way, a few years after that, we moved to a different house. Now, a lot more than just that one story has happened to me, and I'm glad to be rid of that place. Of course, it could be played off as motherly instincts telling my mom my sister was hurt, or one of our neighbors pulling a prank on me when I was home alone. But the stories piled up like that. It's almost too strange to be true. Now that we're out of there, I've had significantly less sightings. I now know one thing for sure. Listen to those voices in your head, but definitely don't follow the demonic-sounding ones, just the ones that tell you to rescue your children. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.